Hey there, I'm Rachel Ehring from Dream Lavender Music, and you're listening to the Dynamic Piano Teaching Podcast, the show that dives into piano pedagogy without being stuffy. If you're a piano teacher who wants to go beyond the method book to create an engaging, innovative studio, you've come to the right place. So let's get started. Today I have the privilege of talking to Christina Whitlock, host of the Beyond Measure podcast. There are many, many topics that Christina and I could have delved into, but we chose to spend most of our time talking about supplemental repertoire. If you are a method book piano teacher who has been wanting to add more supplemental songs to your students' lessons but weren't sure where to start, you've come to the right place. Or if you are a seasoned teacher who is always on the lookout for new and fun songs, Christina has you covered. Here's my conversation with Christina Whitlock. Welcome to the show, Christina. I'm so excited that you're here with me today. Can you introduce yourself and tell us a little about your teaching studio and your business? Sure. Well, my name is Christina Whitlock, and I have an independent studio here in Muncie, Indiana. And I have been teaching for 28 years now. Wow. Uh, my current <laughs> thanks. Uh, my current studio is 42 students, and that is divided up between some private and some group instruction. And I also host a weekly podcast for music teachers, which is called the Beyond Measure Podcast, uh, where I like to call myself your anytime piano teacher friend. Yes, I'm sure that most of our listeners are probably familiar with you and your podcast. So I'm kind of fangirling here today to have (laughs) you on my podcast. This is so exciting. Thank you for being here. Anytime. I will talk to my people any chance I can. So our main topic today is going to be about supplemental repertoire because I've seen um, you talk about that in various places and forms. And it's something that honestly, I don't know as much about as I wish I did. So I'm so excited to learn from you today. Um, But first, I would love to hear about some of the other topics that you're interested in and maybe some of the resources that you have available for teachers. So wherever you want to take that. Well, I'm interested in just about everything. (laughs) (laughs) I always, I laugh because, you know, like all the business advice for teachers is always like, oh, find your niche, niche down. And I'm like, I just like it all. I love teaching every age group and every level. And I just, you know, I want to do all the things. It's a real problem. Um, (laughs) But um, with that, I think my, my main heart right now is actually on the teacher community and just helping us um, find solidarity in one another and recognizing one another as resources instead of sources for comparison or competition and that kind of thing. I just think teachers need other teachers so much. And so with that, I've tried to develop several resources and the list is growing of um, opportunities to help teachers learn kind of alongside me. Um, And so one of those is my Patreon community. So I do have a community over on Patreon where we gather together once a month and we work through a specific um, piece of teaching repertoire. And we have so much fun doing that. So I pick a piece and then we all kind of, um, you know, I'll, I'll give my rundown of things that I would start with and how I would introduce it and then other teachers share. And that's just such a great time of learning with one another. And so that's something I've grown to really look forward to. Um, and I've also developed a course called the Studio Foundations course. And that is basically geared toward any teacher who just feels a little stale or a little just in need of um, just some more zest in their piano teaching life. (laughs) So it's a combination of 14 basic principles that I try to run my studio by for a satisfying and effective teacher life. (laughs) And these are mostly things that were not expressly taught to me in any kind of pedagogy course, Um, just more like real life lessons learned in the field. So that's really fun. And I do individual one-on-one consults with teachers who are looking to revise studio policies or learn more about supplemental repertoire or whatever. So um, I feel really blessed to be able to be in a position where I have been able to help so many teachers. And again, on we go. (laughs) Yes, that's perfect. 
So we'll put links to all of those resources in the show notes. And I have to say your um, branding is our anytime teacher friend. I just <laughs> met you about five minutes ago and I feel like we're already besties. So <laughs> I can recommend you now as a anytime teacher friend. Thanks. I feel that same way about you. And I truly, I know I've told my husband before, I'm like, how can I make a living just being friends with other teachers? <laughs> I'm like, and you're this, well on your way. <laughs> this, well, you know, it's certainly, <laughs> certainly not uh, my primary source of income, but it is so fun. Um, I really, I don't know. I think I'm just so thankful for this profession. It found me at an early age and I feel like I've like grown up in this work. And so to help other people do the same thing, is just, it's so great. Can you share a little of your story of how you became a piano teacher? What led you here today? Sure. Um, there's a very funny story about the fact that my dad went out one day to buy my mom a new washing machine and somehow ended up stopping at a piano shop and bought me a Kawaii Baby Grand instead. Well, I mean, he went and bought the washing machine too, but um, <laughs> managed to decide he was going to surprise me for my 14th birthday for this piano. And <laughs> then when he got home and told my mom, uh, she was like, um, she needs to play play the piano and see if she even likes it, which is very funny because what 14 year old is going to turn down any new piano. Um, yes. <laughs> so anyway, um, when I went to try it out, the owner of the store was saying, oh, we need a piano teacher. Will you come teach at my studio? And I was so flattered, obviously. I just thought that was the best compliment ever. Um, and then it, that was a store that was not in my small town, but my small town music store also needed a piano teacher. And once they caught wind that I was being, you know, offered this job elsewhere, they decided to come in and <laughs> offer me a job. So at the ripe old age of 14, I started teaching at my small town music store. And um, yeah, the rest is history. I've maintained a full studio ever since. Wow, that's a crazy story. So you were already taking lessons, I assume, prior to uh, getting the baby grand piano. Yeah, so it was pretty well established that music was like my thing. Um, and my um, I just grew up in a really small town and it was like classic big fish, small pond situation. And the only other teacher in our town was my teacher and she was full. So the next logical step was to find her most advanced student. And that was me. Where you are today. I think that's so important. Um, I see a lot of teachers um, that want to be kind of judgmental towards young teachers. And I just think like, thank goodness I wasn't around in the early days of the internet and <laughs> social media where I might have read something, you know, contradictory to the fact that I should be teaching. I thought it was great. And then I was providing a service to my community. Um, and I still feel that way. So I think instead of judging the younger teachers, I just like us to band together and help them uh, because, you know, we're much better off that way. Yes. And, you know, I think almost every person that I've interviewed for the podcast has said they started teaching when they were a teenager, as yeah. did I. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because I teach in the summers um, a series of pedagogy courses for high school students. And I was just meeting with one this morning and it's very much the same thing. You know, he's just had, you know, family friends that say, oh, can you teach, you know, my, my little one piano? And, you know, I feel like instead of just shaking our finger at them, like, let's help them figure this stuff out. Yes. Um, and we all know it's a learning curve anyway, that experience is the best teacher. And so the more experience we can get, like, I'm so thankful I learned all of those hard lessons early and, you know, can still have energy and enthusiasm <laughs> to, you know, bring forth, you know, all of those things here at the ripe old age of 41. And I think that um, when you start teaching, when you're still in lessons with a, a quality teacher, that can be really helpful. You're doing both. You're the student and you're the teacher. And that can be a really good journey to take. Absolutely. And I mean, and shouldn't that always be the case anyway, right? Like I always say, like the main mark of a teacher that starts to lose their effectiveness is one who doesn't think there's more to learn. 
Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I was talking to a friend the other day, she's a therapist, but she sees a therapist. And I've always heard that, right? Like a good counselor also gets counseling. And mm-hmm. I think teaching is so much the same way, right? Like we could all still be in lessons, right? And many of us are. Um, but to make sure that we are still constantly exploring that educational journey is just so important to me. Absolutely. So we are going to dive into supplemental repertoire because I have so much to learn. You're going to teach me today. <laughs> Yay. Um, so first of all, tell us, how would you even describe supplemental repertoire for our young teachers who maybe don't even understand the concept? Well, that is a question in and of itself, isn't it? (laughs) Um, So supplemental repertoire in general is meant to basically refer to any kind of teaching music that is outside of a method series, right? So we all have our method books of choice. um, But what I, I use mine a little differently because I actually use methods a little bit more as supplements. And I try to do the bulk of my students learning through repertoire as much as possible. Um, I believe very much in what I consider to be a repertoire, like a repertoire rich approach to teaching. Um, Meaning that um, while I like to work on a very minute level and work very detailed with students, there's also an amount of quantity that really helps develop confidence in the learning process. So we all know sometimes a student will get stuck on a piece in their method book and you'll want them to do it like another week and then another week and then another week. And there are times to dig your heels in, but there are also times where you can say like, okay, that is clearly a concept that's an issue. Let's work on that concept in another piece. And we can continue to develop that skill, but also give you that mental satisfaction of, you know, turning the page or you know, checking it off the list or whatever it's going to be. So anyway, supplemental repertoire is just anything outside the method book, as far as I'm concerned. Sounds good. And at what point in a student's journey do you um, introduce supplemental repertoire? Is it from the very beginning? It is from the very beginning, if you're in my studio. <laughs> so I just, and this is funny, I was talking about these high school students that I that I work with in the summers. And I'm just blowing their minds with this. They're like, what do you mean we don't only work through the method book? (laughs) Um, But there's just so much repertoire in the world, right? Like this is the biggest benefit of playing the piano, right? Is that we just have endless repertoire. And to me, as a teacher who teaches a lot of students day in and day out, I don't want to teach the same pieces all the time. (laughs) So I want to teach as much as I possibly can. And that keeps me fresh, keeps my recitals really interesting for the record. Um, And it just, it helps all of my students feel like they're not just all doing the same things. Um, That said, there are times when I'm jealous (laughs) of my teachers who only like teach, you know, 10 pieces a week. (laughs) I'm like, boy, that might be easier, but yet I can't go back. (laughs) Yeah. It's a lot of work to add the supplemental repertoire, but worth it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a matter of getting to know what's out there. So that is really the biggest hump I think teachers have to get over, right? Yes. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Mm. So let's start actually with the very beginners. Um, Can you give some examples of what you use for those students who don't read on the staff yet? Sure. Um, So I've got a lot. And when we talk about my favorite supplemental pieces, I'm like breaking out in hives over here because (laughs) I'm so afraid of leaving out someone that I really love. Um, So I just have to say, I'm so grateful to all these composers and the publishing companies um, that get this music in our hands because as teachers, we're only as great as the music that we're teaching, right? Like that's our hook uh, for our students. They have to be in music that they enjoy playing. Um, And so anyway, I just have to give them their cred and I don't want to leave anybody out today. (laughs) But um, in terms of pre-reading music, um, I use a lot of Wendy Stevens um, over at composecreate.com. Um, she's got all kinds of pre-reading pieces and wrote pieces, and she's got this whole series of what we call what she calls short sheets. And they're these great, just one-page pieces um, that 
you know, you can buy studio licenses for. At the beginning of a release, she always offers these bundles. So they're very affordably priced. And then I have endless supplies of these digital scores for the lifetime of my studio, right? Um, and so I do a lot of those pre-reader pieces. Um, I like that she often will have black key and white key combinations in that pre-reading. So it just gives us a little bit more variety of sound. Mm -hmm. um, and so she's a favorite. She also has a printed book called Black Key Blast. And that's a really good go-to for me. Um, Kevin and Julia Olson have this fantastic little blue book called Pre-Reading Made Fun. Um, and that's part of an actual series that they did put out. But that blue Pre-Reading Made Fun book, I use all the time. <laughs> and it's really interesting um, if you've never seen it, like the, the pre-reading notation is very different than anything else you find anywhere. It's actually just like pictures of the keys themselves with the numbers written on them. And I think, I don't know, maybe it's just sentimental, but both of my girls, I have two girls, they're 12 and six, and when they were very young, we would, both of them in our journeys, we got started with them playing and they both hit kind of a wall at different times. And I busted out Kevin and Julia Olson's pre-reader made fun. <laughs> and they, it has like, a, it used to have a CD. Now it's online, of course, but that they could just play along with. And they would sit down and play through that book, which, you know, so it'd take them like 20 minutes and they would just sit down and play with the music and sing along and they're really easy, but they're cute. I love Olson's lyrics. They're always good. Um, and anyway, I just feel like they always help rejuvenate my kids. So a lot of my littles, I'll start in that book right off the bat. Okay, nice. I don't have that one. So I'm, make, I'm taking notes here as we go. <laughs> Great. I think supplemental repertoire can be really, it can feel really overwhelming to teachers if they're used to just doing the method books. Um, do you have any advice for teachers who want to get started with supplemental repertoire, but don't really know where to start? Yeah, I think there's, there's two things with that. So first of all, you have to get really good at actually looking at your music and deciding what it's asking your students to do. Mm -hmm. um, we've probably all been in that position where we give a student a piece and then all of a sudden we realize as they're into it that it's kind of above their heads or, oh, I didn't realize you had to stretch that spot or, oh, I didn't realize, you know, it's using that rhythm we haven't talked about or whatever it is. And then you feel like you're kind of teaching on the fly, right? Yes. And you're kind of throwing things at your students and they're confused and you're sweating and <laughs> it's just not a good thing, right? Um, and so I do, I feel like um, when I was doing my master's degree, uh, we spent a lot of time dealing with uh, this book by Max Camp, um, and it's called oh, Teaching Piano, a, Syn a Synthesis of Mind and Body or something like that. Um, but Max Camp uh, developed this system for rating the skills required in a piece, and there's six stages. And it's funny because in all honesty, as I was learning it, I was like, I am never going to use this. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't actually actively use this like staging system, but it did teach me how to really look for the elements that are used in a piece. So, you know, do like what intervals are here and, you know, what other <laughs> skills are, you know, coming up that my students are going to need to know. Um, and so that to me is a huge skill when you're giving supplemental repertoire. Um, this probably also leads to a kind of, I don't know, off the beaten path theory of mine, <laughs> but I love to give my students pieces that are easier than their other work, right? Mm. I do not want my students to always think that that the only music worth studying is the hardest that they can handle at that moment. Right. Yeah. Um, I think, so I always encourage them to go back and play old pieces. Um, and I lend them books a lot out of my lending library throughout the week of just like, just go play this for fun. It's great sight reading experience. And sometimes they stumble upon something they really like. So in general with the supplemental rep, like aim lower, and then you can also have some challenging pieces in that same regard. You know, I mean, I just, I always try to have my students with different levels of pieces kind of in the mix. So we've got longer term goals. Their method book pieces are generally things that they can almost sight read through um, because I mentioned I use methods a little differently. Mostly I let those be almost self-guided pieces that they learn independently and come back and show me. 
And then we spend most of our lesson time on supplemental rep. That's really good advice, Christina, to have different, different levels and to aim lower, because Mm -hmm. I know I found myself doing that too, where you pull out a piece that you think it's going to be great. And then you're like, oh, they haven't learned this, this, and this, and I'm going to have to be like teaching all this new content that they're not quite ready for. So I like that. I think that's a great place for teachers to start. You know, I spent, (laughs) I think I've got this very long history in my own studies of like convincing my teachers to give me harder and harder pieces. Um, And, you know, my first teacher, I was with her for 10 years and I was her, you know, most advanced student ever. And so she like, I was like, I want to play the revolutionary etude. And she was like, oh, sure. And, (laughs) you know, I was not ready to play the revolutionary etude, but boy, did I. Um, (laughs) So, you know, anyway, and and my master's teacher will tell you that I gave him a very strong sales pitch to play the pieces I played on my master's recital, which is funny. I don't even remember doing that, but it sounds like something I would say. So, um, you know, but I also have such a long history of just not performing up to my own standard. And it's because I was playing repertoire that was too big. Um, and I am so adamant that my students are going to play repertoire that shows off all their strengths, but is something that they can really, truly handle um, because, oh, it's just not not great the other way around. Everyone gets frustrated, right? Mm-hmm. So let's talk some specifics. <laughs> Who are your favorites and why? <laughs> oh, man, here I go. Okay, well, I was just thinking... Um, just some of the favorites that I have, uh, would be, we've mentioned Wendy Stevens and Kevin Olson. Um, Mary Leaf is a composer that I just love, and she's got some collections for elementary students up through pretty advanced pieces, and they're all so good. (laughs) I love every piece that she writes and she's got some great duets, um, and ensemble pieces. Um, but her duet parts, like the teacher duets for the elementary solo work are just so beautiful. So she writes lyrically really, really well. Um, I won't go on and on about everybody, but, uh, Carolyn Miller is another favorite of mine. Carolyn Setliff is another Carolyn favorite, <laughs> uh, Chrissy Ricker. Of course, we've got Catherine Rollin and Melody Bober. Uh, Jason Sifford is a terrific composer. Um, he lives out in Iowa um, and writes really just thoughtfully and uh, really innovative, imaginative pieces that my students love. Um, oh, um, Gillock. I teach a lot of Gillock from, you know, early stages on up. Again, someone who just wrote really thoughtfully for every level of development. So, um, that's a good start, right? <laughs> that's a great start. I was trying to write them all down and I stopped after about the, the third one. So I'll have to go back and catch them all. So I'm going to do a little, uh, a quiz here with you. Ooh. I'm going to give you a scenario and you can tell me, um, some good supplemental repertoire for the said student. Fantastic. So Yes. I have a seven-year-old student who's progressing well, plays hands together, but cannot keep a steady beat. What would you recommend? Okay. There's so many different places to go, but I will tell you if they, (laughs) there's a magic, like we all consider these like student saver pieces, right? I think we should all have a list of like 10 or 12 pieces that we know our students are going to love. Um, There is this piece by Jennifer Eklund uh, that is called Endgame. So Jennifer Eklund is the mastermind behind Piano Pronto. And she's wrote this piece called Endgame. Uh, Many people know it. You'll know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Um, It's hand crossing. It's very, it's easy to teach by rote if you just need your students to have something that's flashy. Um, But it's also in a very strict eighth note pulse division. There's a little bit of syncopation in the, in the contrasting theme as well. But, um, that to me is always a win. If I catch a student who's just seems the tiniest bit like disinterested in what they're doing, it's time for end game. <laughs> um, and I will say that I think she knew it was such a lightning strike that like there's many versions of end game. <laughs> She's got a three movement sonata 
sort of thing based around it. Um, and then it's, there's an easy version and a more complicated version and all kinds of things. But, um, I think that is a pretty solid go-to. And since that has that steady eighth note pulse, I think, um, anything that's like rhythmically steady and consistent is going to be your best bet there. Right? Yes, I agree. All right. Next one. I have a nine-year-old boy who is bored with piano and he shows strong potential and has a good ear, but he's just bored. <laughs> sure. So, okay. Let's talk about rote pieces for a moment, shall we? Yes. <laughs> I love that rote teaching is like kind of having a moment in the sun right now mm -hmm. uh, because I grew up in a situation where, I mean, I mean, I just thought that was like the worst thing you could do, right? Like you can't just show someone how to play a piece and then like <laughs> have them play it. Like that's cheating, right? Yes. They'll never learn to read music. Isn't that what we always think? Like if you just, mm -hmm. you know, and certainly there are some other steps involved here. Um, but I think there are some really terrific composers of rope pieces out there. So some of my favorites are Paula Dreyer. Um, she writes the Little Gems for Piano series. Um, my favorite of those books is what's called, let's see, it was originally called The Advanced Primer. And now I think it's called The Creative primer or something like that. They rebranded it. Um, okay. but it's done in, um, kind of in conjunction that it's designed to be used with Irina Gorin's tales of a musical journey. Um, and anyway, I just, I love those rote pieces. And I think it, because I've been here too, I've, I've worked with some students that have incredible ears and show up to their lessons. A lot of them have strong, like kind of like gospel church roots and they've learned a lot of things in that style um, and they come to me and nobody wants to be able to play these big thick chordal passages and then all of a sudden be stuck going e d c <laughs> yes <laughs> right yes, that is, yes that's the worst for them so i think finding a bridge uh, is really important. And I think rope pieces can serve that. And if you teach rope pieces in the right way, and Samantha Coates does this really well over at her Blitz book sight reading or uh, rope repertoire, whatever she calls it. <laughs> um, she does this idea of like, okay, I'm going to teach you this piece by rote, and then we're going to look at it, right? And we're going to see what it looks like. And then I'm going to change something and that's level two, right? And I'm going to change something up and then you find you know, kind of spot the difference. And then we're going to learn it that way. And then level three, we spot another difference. And that just connects what they're playing to what they're hearing and what they're seeing. And it becomes a multi-sensory experience. And I do, I feel like we often miss the mark in teaching how students to read because a lot of how we've been taught, right? How we grew up being taught is, um, you know, anyway, we've kind of missed the dots that really need connecting <laughs> in that process. And so anyway, I would give your nine-year-old boy some, some rope pieces and let him have some fun. <laughs> nice. So you sort of um, already answered my next one, but maybe we can dive a little deeper into it. Mm -hmm. I'm a 13 year old girl who loves playing pop songs by ear, but needs to work on her note reading. How would you help her? So, um, again, I do think it's a balance. Um, and at the same time, I think th at that point, you just have to, have to have a lot of conversations. So I always like my students to realize that, you know, my goal for them is to have all the skill sets <laughs> because I grew up being told that you either read music or you played by ear. Right. And I was always like, Oh, well I, I read music. So that's what I do. And I just didn't even like, it kills me. I didn't even try to play by ear because I was like, I'm a music reader. Um, and so, you know, they all know, like most of my students who come in with that position, like most of them have encountered people who only play by ear. Right. And I feel like there's a lot of them in the world, right? They're like, I don't know what that music says. I just know how to do this. And so I just have a lot of conversations with them about, you know, if you can do both of these things, then you are endlessly employable, first of all, yes. <laughs> whatever kind of musical endeavors you want to go seek out. Um, and then the two just feed each other. 
So with those students, and I know this isn't really about supplemental reps, sorry. That's okay. (laughs) um, With those students who play strongly by ear, a lot of times I'll let them, or, you know, they'll, I'll take a passage of what they've got going on and I will have them notate it themselves Mm. kind of like in reverse. Right. And then that's again, just connecting a different set of dots than they did otherwise. So that can be really helpful. Yeah. That's really good advice. I like that. Uh, yeah, I was the same way. I was a great sight reader and mm-hmm. still to this day, I can't play by ear and I regret it. I wish that I could. I wish <laughs> I could do you both. you can, Rachel, you can. <laughs> <laughs> you have the skill sets, but it's a matter of time, right? Yeah. And I mean, and that's what I came to as well as, you know, I, I don't know, my whole saga is that, you know, I hit this wall when I was doing my master's degree and I was like, why can I play Chopin ballads, but I can't, you know, like play, you know, whatever, (laughs) you know, I can't sit down and just play a four chord piece. What? Right. Mm -hmm. Like, and it just really bothered me. And I started just to, just to experiment and to try. And I still, it's not my preference. It's not my comfort zone. I don't, you know, wish to sit down and play, you know, show tunes at a party by ear (laughs) kind of, you know, I just broke out in a cold sweat. And at the same time, you know, like I, you really, you have the capability. See, and here I am teaching you. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't want you to think you can't, but you may not have the time to devote to that skill right now. And that's okay. That's okay too. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. My pep talk <laughs> for the day. <laughs> all right. So let's talk about how you found all of this repertoire. I find browsing music on Amazon or Sheet Music Plus can be really um, daunting and I usually just get frustrated and give up. I would much rather go to an actual music store, but they're hard to find these days. They're so hard to find a music store where you can actually browse music. Do you have any tips for finding supplemental pieces in the digital age? I do. Um, I'm so with you that the online universe just feels really overwhelming. It's like every other aspect of piano teacher world right now. There's just so much content and trying to weed your way through your to your to find your favorite things is really challenging, right? Um, I feel like for me, this isn't an option for everyone, but where I really fell in love with supplemental repertoire was when I would go to national conferences and you hit this giant exhibit hall with all the publishers there. And I would just spend hours just paging through everything they had. And they always have pianos there so you can sit down and play it. Um, and, you know, the composers are always there. So you get to talk to them and hear their favorite pieces or their recommendations. And again, I know that's a financial uh, commitment. But if you're ever able to go to one of those large scale national conferences like MTNA or NCKP, um, I think the exhibit hall is kind of its own destination in itself because it's so fun to see that stuff, especially when you're not used to knowing what's out there. Um, beyond that, you start to just kind of pick your favorites, right? Um, so again, I was talking about Wendy Stevens, like her catalog is all housed on composecreate.com. Um, fortunately in the online realm, publishers have gotten a lot better about having online previews, right? Mm -hmm. So you can definitely, you know, you can see what you need, um, on Piano Pronto's website. I mean, everything is visible and there's recordings to everything. Um, and mostly on Sheet Music Plus, you can almost always get a preview of at least a page or two of pieces. So I really appreciate that. Um, but publishing houses will have different like new release programs where they will send you like a handful of new releases every time they come out. And so that's definitely something you can look into. Um, And there are just, you know, there are ways to find things. Um, There are publications, like if you look at the National Federation of Music Clubs, like they have a bulletin that contains the pieces that are on the list. And that list is revised every four years. And um, I participate, I participate in that event and that's where I learned a lot of the pieces that I teach now as well. Um, they're somewhat leveled in that program because students obviously enter by level. 
Um, it's a little subjective, of course. There's always within every level there are easier pieces than others, <laughs> um, and not all of them are amazing. But it's a pretty good like someone has felt them worthy of being on this list, so it's a good place to start. Or things like the RCM books, uh, you know, the, those repertoire books are fantastic. They are not cheap, of course, but they're also really good compilations of what's out there. Great. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, can you speak a little bit about classical repertoire and how you supplement with classical pieces? Yeah, because um, I do a lot of that too. <laughs> I feel like I always I figured. <laughs> I told you I can't niche down. I like everything, Rachel. <laughs> so I think that the best thing to do when you're looking to add classical repertoire to your to your students. Um, a lesson plan um, is really just to find a series that you like. So for instance, a lot of people don't know this exists, but you know, uh, Faber with Piano Adventures, they have a piano literature series. Mm. And I laugh because I bring it up all the time, like it's common knowledge and teachers often tell me they don't know it exists. Um, and there is a preparatory level of that series that is all in five finger positions. So now some of us don't believe in five finger positions. I get it. But if you do, <laughs> then all of those pieces lay within the hand um, in five notes. And so that is a great place to get your students started with historical literature. Um, and then that goes through, there's um, the prep book, and then there's four more levels after that. And that takes you well into the intermediate realm. Um, and then beyond that, you have different uh, series like Masterworks Classics or um, Nancy Backus uh, put out this great collection through Alfred called Exploring Piano Classics. And I love that collection because they have a technique book and a repertoire book. And so it's kind of a way to keep a method sort of approach going through the intermediate levels. And those like um, the first book in that series is like, it's not a, a level one kind of book. <laughs> so it's, it's definitely into the early intermediate, late elementary stage for sure. Okay. Um, but anyway, so I, I feel like if you pick one series that you like, there's Keith Snell, um, there's, you know, there's several historical collections, then that starts to get your feet wet in terms of what's out there. And then you can pick collections, you know, specifically geared towards what your students are into. Um, but I do, I mean, I think that that's a great way to go. Uh, Melody Bober also has a series called Perfect Ten. And the Perfect Ten books are half historical literature and half her own compositions. And so those are also kind of nice because you get a little bit of both. Yeah. And, you know, my, my stance is that if we are not introducing our students to this historical literature, and if we are not showing them how beautiful it can be and how artistic it is, then like who do we expect to show them? Yeah. So I think a lot of times when we're talking supplemental repertoire, people assume that that means we're like trying to keep our students super interested in their music, which we are, but that doesn't have to be at the exclusion of the historical repertoire. Like they're so, they're like, that's just so good. And I want my students to know that. And I take great pride in being their gateway into it. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's, such good advice. Thank you, Christina. So can you share a story of a student who really connected with a piece of um, supplemental repertoire outside of the method book and maybe how it changed that student, maybe their practice habits or their performance or something? Yeah, um, I have a few, like um, when you hit that intermediate stage, there are some really great supplemental pieces out there that, you know, when you're not ready for Chopin yet, there's, you know, a lot of great stepping stones, right? And um, <laughs> I wasn't even thinking about this until you just asked this question, but I've got this very dear student who was, you know, one of those students I had her for like, what, 12 years, and then she graduated and she's graduated college now. And um, she sent me a text this is really funny, you guys. <laughs> she sent me a text recently and she said, um, she's like, how do you feel about tattoos? And <laughs> I said, well, I said, they're not for me, but you know, you do you. Um, and she goes, oh, good. I wanted to show you this. And she tattooed. <laughs> uh, Melody Bober has this piece called Rain on the Lake. It's in her, um, 
uh, what is that series called? Uh, I think it's in, is it in Grand Solos for Piano, I think, anyway. But this is this piece that the student thought was like her capstone like performance at uh, her senior recital that she did. Um, she loved it so much. And she had a line of it tattooed on her arm. <laughs> oh my gosh. And she said, okay, that was not what I was expecting oh. from you, Christina. Well, I, uh, I wasn't going to say that. And it just came to my mind. And I thought, I have to tell Rachel this story. I have, I have to write Melody Bober and tell her that my student <laughs> tattooed her piece on her arm. <laughs> Because I happen to bet Melody Bober never saw that coming. <laughs> Probably not what she was thinking when she wrote the song. Yeah. It's so funny. But I it it is one of those things. I mean, this is a student and she's not, you know, she doesn't have a career in music. Um, and she barely plays now still. But although I think it's because she's been moving around and, you know, settling her life. I think she'll go back to it. But I just thought of all things, like, look at that. Like, who would have thought? <laughs> so there is a there is a piece that made a real impact, Rachel. <laughs> it sure did. <laughs> the- I would just say in general, I have so many pleasant memories from recitals and things where students, you know, they're ready, you know, and you know, they're prepared. But then, you know, this last recital I had, I just, I had student after student that just really rose to the performance occasion, you know, and mm-hmm. just really poured it on so thick for the audience. And, you know, their phrasing was so on point, you know, and, and that's, that's really the joy of the supplemental repertoire, right? Is that you can teach any concept you want, you know, in a method book, you tend to be like, okay, here's the piece we're learning staccato and here's the piece we're learning fourths and here's the, (laughs) you know, and of course we want to tie all of the musicality into everything that we play. Of course we are. But, you know, when you just have this piece of music that feels like, you know, music for the sake of music, then that's, it's really powerful. And they tap into that. They really do. Thank you, Christina. You have brought so much value to the episode today. And I know that our um, listeners are all going to want to go shopping now. (laughs) (laughs) I know I want to go shopping now. Um, I'll put as many of these resources as I can in the show notes so that people can um, find them and do some more research. Um, Before we end, I have a few questions that I like to ask everyone. First of all, what is your favorite music to listen to when you're off the clock? It it really depends on what I'm trying to do. Um, I'm known to do a lot of my work to like Gregorian chant. (laughs) And I listen to a lot of like medieval slash like Renaissance music around here when I am in deep work mode, which is very strange. I recognize (laughs) my husband will come home from work and be like, why are we in a cathedral all of a sudden? (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I also listen to a lot of show tunes and I mean, you know, I mean, I'll listen to Hamilton like any, any day, anytime. So um, (laughs) that's all well and fine too. So is there a music teacher in your past that had a particular impact on your teaching or performing? I think, I mean, all of them, right? (laughs) But um, so I don't know. I think they really all deserve their their own, you know, props in this situation. But I guess the easy answer is um, my master's teacher, his name's Jim Hilton, and he um, he had come to my undergrad to play a clarinet recital. He was collaborating, obviously, with the clarinetist. Mm-hmm. And I got roped into turning pages for him that night. And that's where we met. And uh, we just hit it off. And I was like, hey, like, I really like the way you think about music. And likewise, you know, we had all kinds of great conversations and I ended up coming out to Ball State and doing my master's degree there. And that's where, you know, I met my husband at church out here. And like, it's like my whole life has come from that page turning gig. (laughs) Wow. Never say no to a page turning gig. You know, you just don't change your life. You never know when life is going to change. And I think, wow, I probably would not have ended up in Muncie, Indiana for any other reason. Right. So yeah. I'll, I got to give Jim his props, I guess, for, you know, kind of changing my whole life, whatever. <laughs> yes. Wow. Christina, you are full of surprises today. <laughs> uh, why don't you tell our listeners the best way to find you and connect with you? 
Sure. Um, anyone is always welcome to email me any questions you have at, um, you can find me at beyond measure podcast at gmail.com. Um, but you can also come hang out with me on social media. So, uh, Facebook and Instagram beyond measure podcast. Um, that's me. Great. Christina, thank you so much. This was such a fun episode to get to know you a little bit. And you, um, like I said, you brought so much information to us today and I really, really appreciate it. I can't wait to um, look into more of this repertoire myself and I know our listeners will want to as well. Thank you, Christina. Well, thank you, Rachel. As you could probably tell, we barely scratched the surface of Christina's knowledge of supplemental repertoire. I was frantically scribbling notes and finally gave up and decided I would have to go back and listen again to get all the information for the show notes. I encourage you to check the links in the show notes. I put as much information as possible there so that you will have a great start on finding the songs that Christina recommends. Christina is so kind and loves connecting with piano teachers, so I encourage you to reach out to her if you want more information. Until next time, happy piano teaching! listened to a few episodes of the podcast, you know that I use fonz.com for scheduling and billing. If you haven't yet automated your scheduling and billing, this is the perfect time to check out Fonz. They are offering a free trial for the entire rest of the summer. If you have been on the fence, there's no better time to try out Fonz. Sign up using the link in the show notes to start your risk-free trial today.